Well, thanks for the good introduction and thanks for the invitation because it is very topical. In actual fact, today or yesterday was the time we should have had edibles reaching the shelves. In true Health Canada style, it's been delayed. Uh, certainly here in Ontario and in Quebec and Alberta, we've got to wait till the new year for them to come. But I think you can enjoy them tomorrow uh, over where you are. And uh, what I'm going to go through today is kind of where we are with the regulatory updates and some work we've done about risk assessment and health messaging towards the end. And so really, when you look at uh, the regulations linked to cannabis in general, obviously, it was introduced in 2018. And we had the V2 day, as they call it, the version two uh, with the edibles and topicals and extracts uh, back in October. And it's taken about 60 to 90 days to get to where we are, as in the first edibles uh, hitting the shelf. And, you know, when I said about um, a true form, obviously Health Canada has been responsible for policy and they've kind of trudged a type rope. On one side, they had to introduce the policy because it was uh, demanded of them by the electorates and the government. And also, obviously, they're interested in the revenue it will generate. They've seen Colorado and the multi-million dollar tax revenues, and you know, that comes in handy, doesn't it? And also they had to kind of get policies to try and control the growth of the industry. I think everybody before 2018 was looking at this green rush, not the gold rush, and how to actually restrict it, which they did very wisely or, uh, and also effectively. And, but on the other side, you know, Health Canada is very wary of the fact that uh, you know, anything with marijuana is not good for the public. It has the health negative health uh, effects and essentially in one side they've got to promote it but on the other side they've got to persuade people not to uh, actually partake in it and uh, especially youth and uh, other high-risk groups like that and as i'll go along you know i'm referring to how health canada policy has been on purpose and how it's really putting the onus now on public health to actually police it and i think you'll all uh, sort of sympathize with that since you're actually uh, at the, the, the the mind face in that one. So what I'll be doing um, initially is just giving a kind of overview of uh, marijuana production and the market. I think this goes, um, I think you all know this, but I'll just quickly go through it. So the thing about uh, marijuana, there's lots of different strains out there. And you know, you'll, if you actually talk to a grower, they'll go on a bit like wine uh, people go on about grapes and things like this. And there's different components to uh, marijuana and they interact. So when you have purified compounds like THC, it doesn't have the same effect as taking marijuana from a plant or extracted from a plant. So THC is the psychoactive one. This is what gives you hallucinations and increases your appetite. Uh, but a counter to this is what we call the cannabinoids, which are the CBD. So if you like, THC is antagonistic to T uh, THC, CBD is antagonistic to THC, and they kind of balance it out. And we'll come to why that's significant later on. And also one you might want to take um, note of at the moment is what we call CBN. So CBN is actually a derivative from THC, and this gives a very strong sed sedative feel to it. So if you take C uh, CBN, you, know, you basically fall asleep, and you know, people are actually looking at CBN, which has gone under the radar. And the final component of marijuana is terpene. So this gives you that flavor, and the, uh, obviously the characteristic smell. And if you've ever been around somebody smoking marijuana, it really is very pungent, even at low concentration. And that causes issues of odor and things like that. But the terpenes are important, uh, not only to enhance the effect of THC and CBD, but also to give the antimicrobial sort of facts, uh, factors. And that's what they used as a medicine uh, many years ago. So in terms of production, and it's fairly straightforward, um, if you're doing mass production, you use the clone, and that clone is actually from mother plant. So if you go to a facility, they'll have a mother plant there where they take the cuttings from. Uh, obviously, it's the if that mother plant dies, it's a bit of a uh, limiting factor, but typically it'll go from clones rather than seeds for the simple reason only the female plants produce the uh, cannabis resin, not the male plant. So that's why you go cuttings. And obviously you get strain purities and things like that. Then you actually grow them in soil or you can grow them under hydroponic systems, even aeroponic systems. And as you know, when you think about marijuana growing, you can 
see all the lights and the big halogen lamps that catch fire and things like that. And they need a lot of light over 12 hours. And not only that, but they have to keep cool. So the lights generate a lot of heat. So they have to use fans to cool them down. And obviously the fans uh, cause all kinds of molds to be distributed and the sort of odor to be dispersed. And uh, once they're about six weeks old, you can harvest the flowers. The harvesting time is important because that really dictates of how much THC you're going to have and because it's, uh, you've just got to get the optimum. And once you've got the harvest, you can trim them and then you dry them out. So the drying process is some of the most critical. So this is where things like moles can grow. This is where things can go wrong. And so you've got to have even drying. And uh, it usually takes around two or three days because you've got to protect the volatiles. And then once it's dried down to a moisture content of about 11%, you pack it into vacuum pack bags where you can do the curing. So the curing is where your chlorophyll starts breaking down to make it less bitter. So a bit like fine wine. The longer it's cured, the better it is. So if you're a connoisseur of marijuana, uh, you, uh, you know what to look for. Now, marijuana buds, obviously, are the only thing that was legally available. And they are still popular, you know, when you look at it. Uh, but you get much more consistency and a much more concentrated uh, product if you actually start extracting. Now, extracting, it can be done by various ways. So if you go to a grower's house, you'll see a... Um, if you do go to a grower's house, you'll see a washing machine. So they would use like a washing machine sometimes just to get the trichomes. The trichomes being where the resins uh, sort of uh, released uh, onto the plant. So you can uh, concentrate them. And you can also use ice water to break off the trichomes and collect them and concentrate them. But typically when we're extracting, uh, the use to use solvent extraction. So this is literally where you would add solvents like alcohol, hexane, isopropyl, alcohols and butane and propane, which I'll refer to later, in order to extract the resin, because the resin is obviously not water soluble, it's fat soluble, being hydrophobic, and you can concentrate it off. And by concentrating, obviously you're concentrating uh, the actual uh, components like THC and things like that. So not only do you have to grow, you can grow in a licensed um, sort of facility and in licensed facilities, if you've ever been around one, you'll notice the plants are really heavily density. You know, basically, if you get a mold outbreak of mildew, it just spreads through. And this is why the challenge is it's very unnatural to grow cannabis like that. It's much more better to grow it in the field or if you're at home to grow it uh, inside or outside in, in your garden. So by law or by regulation, uh, you're only allowed four plants per residency, apart from Manitoba and Quebec, which ban it all together. And so the problem with growing your own is that it's very difficult to police. And the other sort of part about, and this is, comes back to the odour, is that your neighbours will start smelling the odour. I remember going down the Highway 7 here in Guelph, and literally you, it used to hit you as you just drove past it. And it really is very uh, sort of pungent. So you get a sort of issue of odors. And obviously when you do get mildew outbreaks um, in home grown, they're more likely to use a pesticide. You're thinking, well, you know, it's just like any other sort of flower I have, isn't it? And that's where risk can come as we'll talk about with pesticide residues. So in terms of uh, home grown, uh, you know, obviously you've got the issue is no policing. Uh, they're really down to their own um, sort of devices. There's no sort of advice to them saying how to do it safely. And But because there's only four plants per residency, it's not such a big issue. If there is going to be an issue, it's just going to be down to the one individual. Now, the problem is, though, is that a few years ago, uh, if you had a medical marijuana sort of prescription, you could go to your doctor and ask him or her, uh, to actually give you a prescription for how many plants you could grow. And obviously, doctors don't really know what's going on in terms of how much dose they have. And so what was happening is that um, there was growing excess, so to speak, and then selling on the rest. And you know the government went to court about this, saying, you know, we can't have this, this is just unlicensed. But the court went on the sort of uh, public's uh, favor and said, no, uh, it's their right to do it. So in a way, this is why, for example, when you drive along and you see some operations which don't seem to be following license rules, they've probably got a collective of people with medical marijuana prescriptions and growing their own plants. But that's just something to look out for. 
So well, the big danger in terms of homegrown or illegal growing is when it comes to extraction. So typically when you're in a facility, a licensed facility, they use CO2 extraction, you know, $30,000 piece of equipment, no problem. Uh, but when you're in domestic environments, it's a bit more basic. Essentially, you get a kind of uh, butane, which I guess they use for refillable lighters. And you essentially just get your marijuana and you'll spray, you'll spray it in and the solvent obviously then takes the resin part uh, down to the bottle, which you can extract with alcohol. And as you can imagine, having um, pressurized butane and domestic environments and flames doesn't go well together. And this is where you can get these sort of chances or possibilities of explosions. And I remember two years ago in, in uh, Manit not Manitoba, it was Mississauga, there was a big explosion in a fire by somebody doing this very act. And so the reason why they want to concentrate is obviously you want to concentrate the THC. This is what's going to get you uh, to where you want to get go, I suppose. Um, and also what extracting does is you can take all those cuttings on what we call shake, which is the sort of pieces left over from the bud uh, to extract the uh, resin from them. And you can also fractionate. So basically you can get rid of the terpenes, which obviously gives you that odor and smell. And some people are obviously adverse to it, but it's supposed to be it gives you the flavors which aren't it's a bit harsh. And obviously with extracts, it's much easier to incorporate into edibles, topicals and things like that. But, you know, when you look at the records in terms of how many um, domestic explosions have been linked to uh, this sort of practice of extracting using uh, pressurized butane, in Ontario, there's been about 37. Obviously in California, which was one of the first ones to allow recreational marijuana, there's over 100. So again, this is a public health risk which needs to be kind of managed and what they were thinking about obviously with the um, homegrown or medical marijuana prescription grown uh, marijuana is how to do it more safely so one option obviously is to make equipment available you know, and we'll talk about how they're getting into the market where they're getting purpose-built equipment so if you want to do it at home you get these sort of um, Bio, well, bio hoods or whatever you want to call them, bio bubbles, where you can literally grow the marijuana in a safe contained environment. And also what you could do is rather than having the uh, halogen lamps which catch fire, you could use LEDs which should, you know, generate less light and things like that. Now, the issue of extraction has been, um, both here in the US, has been one of these sort of big problem areas because the reality is there's many things in marijuana you know, people are going to do it. You can say, I'm going to ban this process. Yeah, sure enough. But you're not going to stop people doing it all because you ban it. And there's sort of policies or sort of thoughts involved in saying, well, if we can't ban it, uh, can't we limit the materials? Because uh, not many people actually use pressurized butane. I'm sure it's got its uses for something, but it's not routine use. You wouldn't get it every day. So there's sort of initiatives trying to limit the raw materials to do that. Uh, but the other thing is, and I'll, this is a reoccurring theme as I go along, is saying if people are going to do it, uh, let them do it safely at least. You know, educate them saying, well, you, know, you don't need to use this blasting. You could actually use ice water and a washing machine or you can use carbon dioxide. And in Colorado, what they're thinking about doing is actually having a central facility. So here in Ontario, for example, we have wine shops where if you want to make wine, you actually go to the shop with all your ingredients and make it there. And similarly, you could have a, a central facility where people could take the marijuana and extract it safely. So all these sort of policies are being thought of, but uh, typically they're going towards a ban as uh, people do. So in different, uh, different forms of marijuana, you'll encounter obviously buds, which you've seen and you know about, the up to around 28% THC. Most of the time, there are balance between CBD and THC. And, you know, if you go to a marijuana shop and they'll go through all this with you saying, oh, you know, if you want this CBD and this THC, if you want willow and willow wisp um, sort of varieties, they've all got these different uh, proportions. And that's the reason why. So in terms of um, recreational marijuana, though, what you'll often find is people associate quality with THC content, which isn't really true, but you know, that's what they do. And so buds only got about 28%. Shake, which as I mentioned, is this sort of remnants of the buds, uh, about less than 18. But when you start extracting, 
Uh, you get hash oil, which could be up to 60%. The most popular one is called shatter, which is like a res. Uh, well, as you can imagine, it's a resin, uh, which is like glass. It's almost like candy, uh, like glazed candy. And what people, the reason why it's popular is what some people do is they'll add this to buds in order to get a bigger high. You know, because uh, the thing with marijuana, you do get sort of uh, insensitive to it. So you need much more to actually get the same effect so they'll do some things like dabbing you know um, put it under your tongue and things like that and knives which i won't go into but essentially you do that to increase the thc content and i'll come in relevant later on and if you're really going high which is a really dangerous stuff is hashish oil which is pure resin which is a bit uh, lethal for anyone now in terms of consumption um, obviously edibles weren't that much available uh, well, it's not available now. Uh, maybe tomorrow there could be available where you are. It's no doubt smoking is the number one sort of uh, form of consumption. And the reason why smoke, you need to smoke it is that you need to decarboxylate the THC and CBD. And obviously, when you're doing smoking, you're doing the same thing. You're heating up to decarboxylate it. You're breathing it in. And when you breathe it in, uh, with the, especially with the terpenes, it literally is very rough. It really uh, does... Uh, take a lining out of your mouth and things like that so yeah people prefer smoking because it gives you that kind of instant uh, effect but other people or the same people like edibles and the reason why edibles are popular is for a simple reason that uh, one uh, they don't have to smoke which uh, so you save yourself um, all that nasty taste and things like that but it's in a different effect you know as you probably all know about you know, when you take an edibles, uh, it's got this sort of slow build up to the high. So with smoking, it's almost instant. So, you know, about 10 minutes later. But with edibles, it just takes around one to two hours. And it's not sudden. You just kind of ease into it, so to speak. And obviously, vaping is another sort of favorite form. And certainly when we go to this V2 cannabis, um, what we're talking about now, actually, the focusing on edibles, most of it's on vapes. And as you know, from uh, the news, uh, vapes have come under a scrutiny because of the sort of lethal ingredients that's in them and uh, the attraction to you. So with vaping, it's one of those areas where it's safer, I suppose, in one way than smoking, but it's one of those kind of areas as well, which obviously represents a very big health hazard, as, as you could imagine. So that's um, the basis, that's your 101 on what cannabis is. And then when we come to the market, as I mentioned to you, Health Canada was very notoriously slow at issuing licenses. So when the policy was actually first announced, uh, I saw growers going into the business uh, years in advance. I would say even three or four years before the actual uh, cannabis day in 2018. And some of those invested so much that they just couldn't sustain it because they were basically putting all this money out with no money coming in. So as you know from the news articles, uh, when it was launched in 2018, there was a big shortfall in supply. And this gave ample room for the black market or the grey market which we prefer, to actually take its place. And they did very well out of it. Now, since that time, uh, licenses have been granted. Uh, Obviously, outlets are an issue as well. I think we've got something like 20 outlets serving 6 million people here in Canada, in Ontario or something ridiculous like that. And it's been a bit of a disaster. So and that's been on purpose. You know, the purpose being that Health Canada don't want people to, uh, the populace, to suddenly take up cannabis smoking or things like this. So it's taken up to around about this year to actually get the supply to satisfy demand. But obviously, you've got a black market, which has been established for a long time. And it's actually grew in those years that we, uh, the intervening years that we've had cannabis, um, recreational cannabis introduced. Uh, but we are aiming to go for oversupply later on next year and the years after. Now, the problem is, is Health Canada has been successful, and so is public health as well, in that this discouraging users. So in reality, there's been no increase in users overall. Uh, there's 4.4% of the population, actually about 4.5 million, I think, uh, people actually consume cannabis, but it's bottom lining and nobody expects it to increase because if you ask somebody, and I go around doing this presentation a few times to different uh, areas, and 
you know, I asked people, has anyone taken up marijuana since it got legalized? And not one person put their hands up. And uh, one, maybe that's because they don't want to show themselves. But, you know, even when you talk to people privately, there's nobody increasing it. And so the question is, is saying, well, we're going to oversupply now. Where is that cannabis going to go? And this comes to another Health Canada policy saying we're going to not persuade the uh, or dissuade, should I say, they're going to dissuade the population to have cannabis, but we're going to export it. So if you go to growers, a lot of their product is actually going abroad to Europe, uh, some to the US and elsewhere, because there's a huge international market. And this is why we're going to have this persistence of the black market there, because that's going to satisfy the sort of domestic uh, sort of demand uh, with the uh, sort of licensed uh, stuff, which one could say is superior, being exported. So this is the reality of a situation. As I say, this is uh, why the illegal market, even though you think, well, we've got so much, we don't need the black market. This is where, why it will persist. And also because of issues of quality, as I'll talk to Una soon. Now, the thing is, is that um, when everyone got cannabis fever, you know, just before the introduction of uh, the recreational regulations, People were buying cannabis stocks left, right, and center, you know, basically put, putting the, the money into it. But once it uh, actually had arrived, the regulatory date in 2018, there was a steady decline in the value of these companies. And there's various reasons for that. For one thing, people got the uh, green fever, as we call it, and uh, basically just they were overvalued. And I suspect, and what's interesting is the people in the edibles uh, arena have this same belief that we're going to have this explosion of uh, demand for edibles like we had for the cannabis. But the reality is not many people actually took the drug up. Uh, I won't be surprised if they actually go against, uh, go off it and uh, go to something else. But so there was high investor expectations. But this health kind of the policy of limiting the outlets or the provincial policy, should I say, of limiting outlets, having shortages because they weren't issuing licenses. And not only is that overpricing it, uh, and the quality issues, because as I said, growing marijuana in a grow operation isn't optimal. It's very uh, unlikely it would grow any other crop because of the sort of uh, criteria and restrictions they have. And it's bound to have quality. And the thing about marijuana production, it's very expensive. There's a lot of people power into it. There's a lot of infrastructure. And essentially, it can't compete on price. So when we think about marijuana growers thinking they've just got bags of money to have and it's really getting squeezed, a lot of the big industry, the big uh, sort of partners have lost a high percentage. And, you know, obviously a lot of growers are going to go to the wall as it uh, goes on by design or anything else. So what I'm going to focus on now is the edibles. Um, so with edibles, there's a, another 101 I've got to show you. And that's the fact about decarboxylation. So if you took a marijuana bud and ate it, um, it might, well, taste funny for a start, but it won't do anything for you. You know, basically, you might have a, a mild buzz or something like that, but nothing uh, in terms of hallucinations or being in a totally relaxed state. And the reason for that is that you need to decarboxylate it first. And you decarboxylate it by heating. You know, this is why people take it as a uh, sort of joint. This is why people use bongs and things like that. Now, the decarboxylation process, you've got to be fairly specific. Um, obviously, you need a high enough temperature for a start. And you can't leave it too long. So if you leave it too long, you get this conversion to the CBN, which is a sedative. So in one, if you do your THC, if you decarbox right, uh, you're going to get a high. If you do your decarboxylation wrong, you get no effect or you get really sleepy effect. And, you know, some users actually like it. You know, so that's a sedative effect if they're having trouble sleeping. So they'll actually over decarboxylate. Now, not only do you decarboxylate to get it active, but once it's decarboxylated, it's kind of on a slow run down. It becomes more reactive. So its stability, its shelf life is less. And so you could find yourself, for example, if you're doing an edible, and you decar you bake it, which decarboxylates at the same time as you're baking your cookie. Um, over storage, if it's stored incorrectly, exposed to the air or exposed to UV sunlight, uh, it starts losing that uh, THC. It starts going down to CB 
CBN. And that's a big issue when we look at edibles because they're very low concentration to start with. So with decarboxylation then, there's various ways of doing it. Uh, domestically, what you would do is just put it on a uh, sort of baking tray and you'll put bake it for 40 to 60 minutes. But what's coming out in the market now is this sort of precision decarboxylator. So you're getting optimal decarboxylation. And the only reason I bring this up is because, you know, basically if you do it domestically where you've got no control really, you don't know how much THC you're making or things like that, you could imagine this is, in theory, could make very high levels of THC, which people aren't obviously used to. So you can get these decarboxylation um, units to optimize the process. But as I mentioned to you, not only do you activate the CBD and THC, but you also start having a shelf life on your THC and CBD as well. In the undecarboxylated form, uh, or the, i.e. the carboxylated form, the shelf life can be over two or three years. But once it's activated, it starts going down. And it really depends on lots of different things. Now, the thing is, is that you don't need to decarboxylate all marijuana. As I said to you, you could go and take a bit of an ex a, uh, a dab, but usually extracts are naturally decarboxylated because of a distillation process they use uh, to separate the fractions out. But if you took some just marijuana buds, uh, you'll have low activity. And you know, people are suggesting it's a very good potent uh, antioxidants, uh, which isn't a good thing, as uh, you know, when you're vaping, uh, it's not good to have antioxidants there. And But people say it's that kind of mild effect. So you might come across this. It's certainly not at the same uh, sort of health risk as a THC, but you know, consumers can get confused saying it contains marijuana. But if it says raw marijuana, then you know it's not really uh, being truthful in terms of if the consumer expects something different. Now, in terms of edibles, you know, we think, oh, you know, they're brand new. But they haven't. Edibles have been around for many years. You know, the first one going back to 1100 AD. And this is called Majun. Uh, I think that's the wrong pronunciation, but it's close enough, isn't it? And so what this is like is like a raw cookie dough with fruits, nuts, and obviously marijuana in it. So you would eat this um, uh, as it is. It's fairly shelf-stable, obviously, because back in those days, they didn't have refrigeration. And it was just used as a medicine. Another thing that was used as a medicine was bang. So bang can be better described as like a marijuana smoothie. So they'll make a sort of paste out of it, add milk. They don't decarboxylate it. Uh, and it used to be used as a medicine. And it's widely consumed in Asia, even today, for that reason. But when we think about marijuana edibles, obviously our thoughts go to brownies. Now, Brownies were actually developed, or well, brownies weren't initially invented by Alice uh, Toklas. Uh, it's a good story about brownies, but I won't go into that now because I'll be distracting. But uh, Alice actually developed the first sort of edible uh, and she chose the brownie. Now, I always like to think she was a genius food scientist for doing this, but I wonder if it's just by accident uh, because, in a lot of ways, the brownies is the ideal food vehicle. Uh, one is that. So you decarboxylate THC when you bake it. And the other thing is that uh, you've got high fat. So high fat, because it's the uh, THC and, re and things like that are hydrophobic, they go into the fat phase. And so it increases the potency, you know, concentrates it up. And also the high sugar content of brownies makes it faster acting you know, due to the metabolism. And obviously it's shelf stable. So in a lot of ways, um, the brown is ideal because it gives you that distribution, the decarboxylation shelf stability. Now, what's not known, and this is where hopefully research in the next few years will come through, is how other components of food interact with uh, marijuana. As we'll talk about, there's a lot of edibles out there. And when you look at edibles, drinks, for example, or drinkables, as we call them, you know, how are they distributed evenly in that and things like that. But that's another story for another day. Now, the thing is, is edibles really did take off and uh, some people uh, prefer to market them before uh, V2 Day. And as you know, in British Columbia, you can go online and you can order any edible you like, um, uh, gummies, chocolates, uh, macaroons, you name it, and they'll be delivered to your doorstep. And online edibles, um, obviously, are very popular. So people, 
you know, people waiting for V2 day, it's not such anticipation because they just go literally to uh, online and can buy them there. And there's no restriction on strength. You can get 30 megs, you can get 100 megs, you know, whatever you, you prefer. Now, here in Ontario, and I'm pretty sure over in BC, the First Nations have also entered the cannabis market. And the, if you go to Toronto, for example, you can get a bus ride up to the First Nations and ever, any, buzz, any edibles you like, you know, cookies, chocolates, you even have pop-up restaurants there and some teas and things like that. So in a lot of ways, I always think of this like the Amsterdam model. So if you've been to Holland and been to Amsterdam, you'll notice people smoking, eating edibles and everything just out in the open. And it's not the fact that uh, the Dutch um, have allowed recreational marijuana. It's just they turn a blind eye to it. You know, see no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. And I think this is a case of the First Nations is that they see it. They don't want to get to this judicial um, sort of uh, stalemate, so to speak. But uh, certainly it's um, what people do and they go Hello. up there and I've seen people's experience with it. Hello, can you hear me? So in terms of um, regulation, are you all right? Oh, someone's on the line. But uh, anyway, um, in terms of um, regulations, what we have is um, the obviously the edibles V2 that came in uh, about two months, two or three months ago. And with the edibles regulations for Health Canada, you know, they took in June, they actually released a, their draft regulations for public comment. And these public comments were on cannabis extracts and topicals. There was a huge response to that in terms of uh, people's comments and written submission. But the reality is, you know, Health Canada took absolutely no notice whatsoever of them. And they just went ahead. Now, with Health Canada's policy, as you can imagine, it was really focused about uh, minimizing use to harm, uh, uh, you, well, minimizing harm to users, should I say, and getting a safe supply. And if you look at the policy that they actually implemented in terms of the regulations they actually uh, published, it was all to do with that, protecting the young, deterring use and sale, reducing the burden on uh, the judicial system, having quality control, and you know, highlighting the risks. So this was their sort of uh, premise or foundation for developing these final regulations. And if you read those regulations, you'll notice a few things. One is that CBD was exempt. So this is why you're gonna see a lot of CBD products coming out and most of them are safe, obviously. The ones that aren't safe are the ones that have been uh, basically uh, mislabeled, we call it, or fraud. So as you probably know, the story about the CBD oil, which was in the US, somebody actually swapped it for cough syrup and the person vaped it and they die from that. And there's other sort of issues with um, those kind of oils in people putting other things than CBD oils, going to gas stations and buying CBD oils, which obviously are totally fake. So with the CDB market, um, it's popular, but I think it's open to fraud, as we'll see with THC, no doubt. Now, the other thing about the, the regulations is that there was a low, only a low dose of THC allowed, you know, individual packs at 10 megs. And to put this into a bit of perspective, um, your experienced user needs about 30 megs to get any effect. I was talking to someone a few weeks ago, and they said they take 100 megs a day. And this is the problem with marijuana. It's, people say, oh, it's not addictive and that. But I think you do get addicted to the feeling. And to get that feeling, you've got to have uh, increasing levels of the THC. So I always liken it saying, um, if you take these edibles that were basically marked at 10 mg to a party, you're basically you like bringing a low alcohol beer to a party. You're not the most popular, I suppose. So the other sort of restrictions to put on was plain packaging, uh, no nutrient substance, and importantly, they described them as a food. And the reason why I say importantly is because in the US, they don't make edibles a food. They even put, prohibit them to put nutritional labels on, nutrient, nutrition labels on the ingredients and things like that. And the reason for that is because if you class it as a food, then you've got jurisdiction of food safety. Now, interestingly, 
uh, Health Canada has said, no, it's going to be a food, which basically puts the onus, as you probably guessed it, on either public health or the CFIA, which is uh, an interesting sort of slant to it. Uh, so it has to be shelf stable and obviously no alcohol and limited caffeine. The caffeine only can come from residual of the plant. So, you know, as a um, as I go around, like, say, doing these presentations, one of the common questions we're always asking is saying, what edibles, given those restrictions, could possibly become available in December when they actually uh, reach the market? Because all we could think of was grey slabs of uh, jelly or something like that. So you know, that's not uh, attractive to children. Uh, but the reality is, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is that it was very different. Now, my sort of theory is, is that Health Canada put all these regulations in place you know, essentially to dissuade those artisanal sort of small businesses to actually start getting into the edibles market. Because when you think about it, um, the need for separate facilities, well, the only people who can afford separate facilities are the big corporations, isn't it? Uh, plain packaging and things like that, all coming from the point of saying, well, you know, that they have to be very strict and uh, restrictive of who's going to supply these. Now, the thing is, is that uh, the word of Health Canada started to slip a little bit when there was this sort of um, announcement that, you know, we know these regulations are strict. We know you can't make it attractive to children. We know you have to have this packaging, which you can't directly drink out of. It's got to be childproof and all that. But they came out with an announcement saying, well, we'll do it by a case by case basis. If you can prove to us it's not attracted to children, it couldn't be mistaken for non medicated then we'll let you have the product go to market. So things like, you know, does it look like a bear? Is it attractive colors to children? Does it smell like fruits, flavors? You know, could it be mistaken? Well, the reality is, is that uh, when V2 Day did arrive, which was yesterday, and this is why I've been scrambling to get new slides and things like that, um, it's very interesting on the sort of products they were having. And the first thing is, though, is that they had this big delay. You know, basically, Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta, you have to kind of mail or get, go online and buy from your legal sources. And I think that was due to avoid the Christmas rush, as you can imagine. But the reality is, is that when you look at the uh, products available, you know, there are beverages, there are this sort of cannabis beer. And when I say cannabis beer, that doesn't mean to say you make beer with alcohol and you put your cannabis in. This is beer which has been brewed alcohol taken out and marijuana uh, put in. Uh, there's been fruit infused beverages. Well, you know, fruit uh, is attracted to children, but they're still they say, oh no, that's fine. You can still have that. So those products are available. Uh, infused alkali water, I always thought alkali water was a bit dangerous to start with, but you know, people are having that. And obviously the brands and confectionaries that are out there as well. So the big companies that are involved in edibles are things like Houseplant, uh, which is endorsed by uh, Josh Rogan, who I think is a celebrity of some kind. Uh, but what you'll notice is a lot of the celebrities are starting to endorse things like edibles. Again, you know, is that making it so it's not attractive to the young and things like that? But that's another argument, isn't it? Uh, but what you're seeing is these uh, big beer companies because getting involved like Cools Molson cause things like that and the reason for that isn't because they want to make uh, marijuana beer as such is that they can see marijuana drinkables being a threat to their business you know because people switch to marijuana drinkable rather than drink uh, alcohol uh, which i don't think will happen to be honest but that's what they think and so they want to be kind of in both parts to it so all these different companies then are producing edibles. And as I say, yesterday was supposed to be the launch date, which didn't quite happen. But there was previews of them, what you can expect. And when you look at what to expect, uh, you look at the health kind of regulations and you look at what's available, and you think, you know, is there something missing here? Has there something happened to the regulations to, uh, to misinterpret? There's chocolates. Um, you know, when you say no confectionery, well, there's chocolates there. There's chewables. Um, and not even stamped. You don't even need to stamp this is THC or marijuana on them. You get alkalized water, you get chocolate. So these things will be hitting the market tomorrow. And as I say, you can uh, buy them at uh, 
Well, I don't know if they're reasonable or not. About eight dollars uh, cho- for two chocolate pieces, which I think is a bit expensive. But uh, these are the kind of edibles. So basically, all the uh, sort of restrictions what Health Canada proposed seems to have gone by the side. Now, as I mentioned, um, the expectation is is that the edibles market will at least get to the point of the flower, the buds markets, and supersede that in the next year or so. Uh, Whether that comes true, uh, we don't know because their predictions on the marijuana market previously were a bit over ambitious. So whether it happens, but I think there is a sort of um, demand for edibles as there are for vapes. But interestingly, even though most effort has been put on to things like drinkables, there's very few people at the moment who take marijuana as a drink, uh, apart from infused alcohol, which I'll talk about a bit later. So whether the... um, beer people or the uh, sort of breweries have got some inside information it's hard to believe that uh, there'll be a success but we'll see about that so when we look at the edible sort of regulations they kind of mirror the uh, sort of regulations that were in place to make uh, marijuana recreational marijuana available in that one a huge delay, you know, basically delaying, delaying, and saying, well, have, you know, it takes time. Well, you know, how long does it take? And really, when we look at the uh, sort of edibles available, they're going to be very low concentration, you know, 10 mg of uh, THC. And this is good for a, a first time user, you know, start low and go slow, uh, but it certainly won't satisfy the bigger market. And also, what there is no consideration of the THC to CBD ratio. So you'll notice if you go online uh, after the presentation, you'll see CBD THC as a one-to-one ratio. Well, that's going to have a very different effect than one that's got more THC. And so there's no, when you say 10 mix THC, you know, if you don't have any CBD there, it's going to be much more potent than if CBD was uh, present. Uh, you get host-related factors. Some of the people are adverse to it. Some people are totally immune to it. But you don't take that into consideration, nor the degree of carboxylation or decarboxylation, nor do you get into the point of how it reduces during storage life. So it brings up this interesting prospect of, do you make the THC high? So when you get to the expiry date, which could be 30 days down the road or even longer, that's when the THC level will be 10 mg. Uh, so these are all questions that weren't even asked um, whilst we're developing these. And really what these regulations have done, obviously, is bring this sort of confusion to industry. You know, Health Canada on one point saying everything's banned, uh, you know, we can't do anything, to this sort of much more flexible mints, chocolates, confectionery, anything you want. And in a lot of ways, it is passing control to the legal market because it's not taking into account what people, how people consume marijuana. So a lot of you, for example, do what we call cross-fading, where they'll, put, they'll smoke some marijuana and take a shot of vodka. I know I shouldn't know that, but this, you know, this, this is the, uh, what, the reality. And you know, if people are going to do that, at least make them products where it's much safer to do than doing it uh, yourself and things like that. But in reality, with the um, sort of edibles, I think because they're increasing the illegal market, Again, they're putting the onus on public health. Now, the other thing is about if we can't get marijuana legally or edibles legally, which are going to satisfy us, you know, where do we go? Well, you know, we'll go to things like cookbooks. And if you go online, you can find a lot of uh, cannabis cookbooks. You can go to celebrity uh, blogs like Martha Stewart, of all people, with Snoop uh, giving you all these recipes on how to consume uh, marijuana edibles. And you can go online and look at the recipe list there and even go to these pop-up restaurants, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But, you know, in a domestic kitchen where people make edibles, obviously the risk of overdosing is much more because you've got no idea what the THC is. You don't know what the decarboxylation is. Is it optimal? Is it, uh, is it going to be uh, less or work more? You've got no idea. And also, uh, when you're making brownies, for example, your THC isn't going to be distributed evenly. It's going to be concentrated in the center. So if you do go to a party, and you're, par- you're partial to a bit of um, marijuana. They always go for the center portion. But anyway, that's before that. Um, you've got all these other food safety issues as well about sanitation, temperature abuse, and cross-contamination. And as I'll talk about, a lot of the marijuana you get is shared. So you'll get it from a friend or a relative. 
And this is where food safety does come apart because I think people, when they put, make these brown uh, marijuana edibles, you know, they're kind of conscious that it's a food goes out the window and I think they consider it a drug and that can cause issues. So what it really needs at the moment is a sort of uh, education guide. I know people say, oh, you're encouraging people to actually make it, but an education guide that enables uh, consumers to source marijuana safely, to prepare it right, store it correctly, and obviously appreciate the food safety aspect. So that's a big knowledge gap at the moment. Now, with the edibles um, being approved, the question is, is saying what's going to happen to these online edibles uh, stores and what's going to happen in the First Nations? My sort of feeling, absolutely nothing. I think they'll just keep going along as normal and not, not much is going to do. I suppose it'll reach a, a point at some time, but we're far away from that point at the moment. Now, another sort of um, fear people have is about uh, having edibles reach the farmer's markets and food service. From what I know, and after talking to a few people, this is really going to happen. I think we might get the pop-up restaurants for sure. We have them in Toronto where you get a special invites and you go uh, at, uh, for the evening. But for farmers' markets, I think they do a lot of dodgy things for definite. But the other thing is, is that they are a family sort of day out and they don't want edibles to be part of that. And normal restaurants, you know, I don't think they would want to partake in that as well. Now, another sort of worry people have is about the uh, marketplace, social marketplaces, Craigslist and eBay and Amazon. And, you know, these got into trouble a few weeks ago by basically selling expired food. You know, and there was another story about that. And, you know, people always question the ethics of Amazon and uh, especially on Craigslist and things like this. But the reality is, if you go on these sites and look for edibles, you probably won't find any. You'll find other things like meat and things that you wouldn't expect. But typically, you wouldn't expect this. And the reason why is because I think the founders have this sort of, even they've got a degree of ethics to uh, to not do this. And it's against a philosophy. And in Canada, we're only one of a few countries that have a federal policy on cannabis. US is so statewide. It's not federal. And so basically by getting into the edibles, they would kind of get a bit too much regulatory focus that they already get, I suppose. But so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Now, a worrying trend is the uh, entry of edibles into the natural food chain. And we hear stories on the news, for example, that talk about one uh, well, in Cambridge just a few weeks ago, uh, where they were saying, oh, these edibles got delivered to a fair and were handed out to children so the children got sick from eating them and you get those stories saying oh the, you know johnny bought uh, some edibles to school and things like this and you know people see it in a humor way to a degree but it is serious in that you know it can cause um, serious uh, illness to children and there is a theory out there, yeah, when you look at investigators, they say, oh, it's an accident, you know, the fact you got edibles which are worth $140 a bag turning up as a dollar uh, auction does, <laughs> is by accident, if you believe that. And I think what we have to watch out for is people doing it intentionally because for whatever reason, but also because this is how drug dealers work. You know, basically drug dealers send out uh, drugs to try and get addicts and that's a conspiracy theory, whether it's true, but I think public health has to take note of that as well. So I'm running a bit behind, but I'll try and go through this as, uh, in, in good time. So with all these uh, sort of risk factors we have, um, what we try to do is get a foundation for risk analysis. And as you know, with risk analysis, you've got different components to it. You've got the risk assessment, you've got risk communication, and risk management. And what we wanted to do at this point, and I've got the FSQA student, Janita was uh, the student on the project, is just try and find a list of what we should be considering as uh, potential hazards uh, in the marijuana edibles field. So the first thing we do is saying, well, what's the most popular edibles we have? And we look on the uh, sort of US, because they've obviously been uh, more advanced than we have for many years in Colorado, especially. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the uh, the top um, sort of edibles are things like mints, chews, mints, strawberries, candies. You know, I always think it's because we like to go back to our childhood it comforts us and things like that. And the other thing is, is that taking into account that people make marijuana edibles at home because they can't source them from uh, 
legal sources. You know, what's the top 10 list of um, edible recipes? So first up is cannabis oil, which cannon oil, which as the name suggests is just infusion. Then we have magic butter, which as the name suggests as well, is the marijuana, which you melt the butter, decarboxylate it, and uh, you make your butter, you can put it into different ingredients. And they've actually got purpose-built magic butter producing units that you can buy. You know, again, this sort of feeding the, the sort of consumer demand for purpose-built equipment. One of the worrying ones is uh, with weed milk, as the name suggests, you basically add weed to milk, a bit like uh, Bang, uh, which I mentioned is popular in Asia. But the most lethal one, I think, is this cross-fading where they actually infuse alcohol with uh, marijuana. And as you probably know, when you're taking marijuana and you have alcohol at the same time, it has a double whammy effect. It basically extenuates the effect of alcohol, a bit like uh, when you're taking sleeping pills and you have that CBN. You know, basically it takes you over the top in terms of uh, overdosing and that. So this is one of the worrying things that you, but you can go online and you can find how to do it. Uh, other things like, garlic cheese pasta which sounds quite nice and cookies and ice cream all these things are uh, basically uh, what people are making at home now the other thing we have to think about is uh, fraud as well so fraud goes two ways one it could be where you're buying something which hasn't got uh, any thc or cbd in or it's got a substitute which is lethal like i was mentioning the cough syrup when you're vaping it uh, but other times, it's too, uh, the other fraud is economic fraud, isn't it? Where you know, basically they haven't got as much THC, for example, as they quoted uh, on the label. And so in a lot of ways, you, know, you could say fraud is just economic crime. You know, it's basically, as long as it's not a hazardous substrate in it, you're fine. But you always think if they're not concerned about regulations in terms of if you're going to commit fraud, then you know, why should you be caring about food safety and things like that? And when we think about fraud, I guess we think, oh, it must be those backroom dealers, the ones that live in the shadows and things like that. But in actual reality, the big businesses have been suspected of fraud, you know, where they've mislabeled, where they've uh, fabricated test results, where they've actually bought in illegal weed uh, or legal cannabis, should I say, uh, to fill up uh, consignments because of their shortfall. So, again, it's this culture of the industry that needs to be addressed in terms of ensuring that it's, um, it's the, the business and people's confidence uh, uh, or consumer confidence remains high. Now, in terms of outbreaks and recalls, I won't go through these because time is pressing. But as you can see, um, the early parts of um, the sort of, well, when start documenting about outbreaks back in 75, these were basically done to manure and raw sewage. So this is where people were cutting uh, marijuana with uh, chicken manure. That's where salmonella, and every time you talk about marijuana, people say, oh, yeah, salmonella. But you know, it's a very unique case that most of the time it's down to moles because, as I said, um, producing marijuana the way they do in these licensed operations promotes mold. And what do you do to control mold? You add pesticide. And some of these pesticides are very limited. They've got 17 that are allowed to use, but you can get some pesticides that are very dangerous, the ones that turn into cyanide when actually uh, de heated. And so these are big risk factors. And things like uh, high moles, for example, are very common um, pesticide residues. And as I said, this sort of license suspension due to sourcing weed, which wasn't uh, from a licensed grower. Then we get pathogens, and uh, when we think about pathogens, I think we always like to think, oh, it must be E. coli, salmonella, listeria. But when we did a sort of survey of marijuana a few, many years ago now, you know, these are unusual um, pathogens. You know, when you look at Entrobacter, for example, you wouldn't expect it to see it uh, in marijuana, but you do. And you, we saw uh, Coronabacter, which, as you know, is uh, associated with baby formula. So, again, we have to get an idea what pathogens are there and what uh, opportunistic pathogens are present as well. Now, the other thing to consider is the fact we've got a legal market, and we'll always have this illegal market, you know, basically uh, left and right, isn't it? And they represent different hazards. So, with legal sales, obviously, you've got that sort of belief, hope, that it's uh, been tested and it's been produced under good conditions, control conditions. 
And obviously, it's convenient. You don't have to go to the back shadows and things like that. But the reality is it's expensive. The quality is not as good as growers uh, usually. And the reason why that is, is that when you meet a grower, they're actually very passionate about their business. And they take it very much more seriously, in actual fact, than a sort of licensed grower. And I know it sounds strange, that, but it's reality. And um, so... Th and with it, you get a relationship with a grower and uh, they, you tend to have a trust. They're a bit like the corner shop kind of syndrome, isn't it? And so the reality is in the illegal sales, in some ways it's safer in, in some respects. But there again, in other ways, it's not. When you think about fentanyl, for example, which has been found in laced uh, marijuana and people fentanyl in to give it a bit of a buzz. They don't do it to poison people deliberately, even though that's the effect. But also with illegal sales, you know, you've got the fraud, mislabeling. So it's all a mixture of things, isn't it? Now, the reality is, is that con uh, consumers, uh, when they rate their sort of um, list of demands, if you want, or their sort of factors which influence their purchasing of marijuana, you know, quality and safety is paramount, price and convenience. So really what it's saying to you, if the legal market got their act together and did things right, then people would come to them. But you know, at the present time, with the restrictions they have in terms of dose and variety of products, you could question it. And when we look at the sources of marijuana, you know, because that's another risk factor, you know, essentially when we say shared, that means, yeah, if somebody bought it illegally and then shared it with somebody else, they're about 50-50. So all in all, and like I say, you can look at this in your own leisure. I'll give you the, I'll get, let uh, the people distribute the slides. You know, this is the kind of list we came up with. Uh, the long story short is that um, with legal marijuana, we think the key sort of uh, risks are going to be pesticide residues and very high THC or mislabeled THC. Uh, in the sort of illegal one, um, again, you know, it could be pesticides, which is a lower one because they don't typically need pesticides because they don't usually get mold problems. But you can imagine it'd be very high THC. And these aren't the people who send their sort of marijuana to third-party labs for testing. You know, they basically, uh, I'm not sure how they do it, but the chances are that you don't know what you're getting. Now, interestingly, and this is way, maybe news or maybe new to you, is that um, illegal marijuana can be high in heavy metals. And the reason for that is because the cannabis plant is very good at accumulating heavy metals. And the reason why you, you hear about this is that they used to grow marijuana in the old gold mines down in California, which were rich in heavy metals. And this is where people would get a heavy dose of these heavy metals. So depending on where it's grown and how it's grown, you could have an issue with that. And other things like mycotoxins, pathogens, again, people have their own sort of theories about it, but these are minor, especially the pathogens, given that we decarboxylate the product and things like that. So this is a kind of, not an objective list, this is a list to start with, and you can prove or disprove it as you go along. Now, to finish off, I'll just talk about a project we did with risk communication. Uh, with risk communication, what we're trying to do is saying, well, in the US, they've had um, recreational marijuana for a long time, so how did they go around sort of organizing it? So Doreen, as she went, which well, didn't go down, she called uh, California, Colorado, and Michigan, and Oregon, just to see what they were doing. And what they were looking at is saying, what's the common feature about these um, sort of uh, committees? Well, these committees were set up by law. You know, basically, if you're recreational marijuana, you have to have state a uh, state law that says you need a committee to make regulations and guidelines. And the common theme through all of the uh, regulate or the guidelines and regs is that Again, keep it out of the hands of the youth, uh, inform parents, avoid, make sure pregnant women know the risk and avoid, make sure they avoid taking it. And in Colorado, they give advice to tourists. And obviously in Colorado as well, they're the only ones that give food safety training to people making edibles, which is good to see. So on these committees, there's various uh, expertise. You've got obviously the people who uh, a public health who are responsible for actually uh, overseeing uh, the, the current marijuana sort of market and make sure it's safe. You get law enforcement, you get the tax people, all these people are what you expect, isn't it, from a committee. Uh, but also in Oregon and Washington, which are unique, is that they invite the public, they invite cannabis growers to these meetings 
to get their input because a lot of the time, you know, growers and the public and uh, First Nations are outside the bubble where they should be involved in the regulation uh, and guideline uh, sort of development. And this is a busy slide. Now, I haven't got time to go through it now, but as I say, you can have the slides uh, to view at your own leisure. But the only ones I would bring out is, or the, the points to bring out, is that a lot of the states have this sort of multimedia platform. So some go on television, social media, some uh, use the websites and information booklets. Now, the most progressive ones I would recommend that you go and see are the ones in Washington and Oregon because they are progressive in terms of they acknowledge people consume marijuana in different ways and they kind of educate them more. You know, they, don't, they do come out a little bit with health advisors saying, oh, marijuana does this to you, marijuana does that to you. But I think what I like about their kind of approach is that they realize people are going to do it, so get them to do it safely. So typically that's the um, different sort of routes to get information out there. And when we asked them, saying, you know, if you had to do it all again, what's the lessons you would learn? I think the key things is you have to have a, a lot of transparency in your decisions and actions. You basically, when you make a decision, people understand why you did it. To have frequent meetings, so you keep up to speed and get initiatives through. But one thing, common theme they did come up with is make don't have giant committees. If you have giant committees, nothing gets done, but they found it much more productive by having subcommittees to look at different aspects, be it advertising, the edibles, retail cannabis. So rather than having big committees, you have these subcommittees that report to a, a sort of executive committee. And the other part about it is our focus campaigns. Don't just go out there blanket saying marijuana is bad and things. You know, literally go with very uh, focused statements about starting low, go slow marijuana and pregnancy which is big in um, california and you know advice education how to keep out of reach of children and the other thing that they learned is that rather than go piecemeal saying well we'll do an advert here we'll put it on the website next week uh what they found in colorado is that they found or oregon should i say is that they found if they did a media campaign so they focused on one thing and launched all these different um messages on different platforms at the same time it captures much more and i think that's the way to, uh, lessons to learn now obviously in canada we have our sort of um, health warning messaging we see the adverts we see the websites and a local survey a recent survey you know essentially only 34 percent of users actually realized uh, there was warnings for a start but nearly only half of them nearly actually learned anything from them warnings so what we're getting to the point is that we have to kind of in the messaging we're giving is to think more strategically about it and how to get it more effective and get it to the people who know and what information they need so that's the big sort of uh, wake-up call for that so in terms of final thoughts obviously edibles uh, will it save the cannabis sector well you know, time will tell. I think it's overestimated uh, what impact it will have. Um, I think consumers do like legal sources. You know, if you ask anybody, they'll prefer to be able to just go into a shop and get some rather than go to someone's uh, backyard or whatever. But, you know, the regulations as they are now are really driving people to illegal. There's nothing there that says, you know, go to illegal or make it yourself. And in the absence of this choice, then you've got these other different routes. And what we need to try and do is educate people with this respect in terms of getting them to um, actually follow safe practices. And, you know, lack of control will lead to uh, threats to health, as we've seen. But health can, if Health Canada don't step up, because they're more interested in the export market, which is very vast, um, basically it's going to be left to public health to pick up the pieces on that. So with that, I'll thank you for listening. I know I've gone a bit over time, but I'll try and answer any questions you might have.